করেছি এখানে ইয়েটা কোথায় গেল গো আচ্ছা কথা ম্যাডাম ওখান থেকে বলবেন এখান থেকে একটু বলবেন
rather what sort of an accommodation and facility arrangement for you uh, so that uh, you know we probably have never seen most of you last year uh, we had a situation where everything was online and uh, except uh, for uh, the exams which were conducted in a hybrid mode so some people did the exams from home and some people did the exams here uh, those who are around this year again as all of you know that the classes have been held in the online mode but luckily we are having all of you here uh, with the idea that the exams which are scheduled to start this friday all of you will be present physically to give the exam uh, but it's all, all, of course it's a very nice thing because we have probably never had this before uh, this sort of interactive session uh, and uh, when i first uh, what to know about this? I was very excited and immediately uh, contacted our director. So we had to reschedule this. We had to work around with the dates a few times because uh, she had some other commitments. But now that uh, we have been able to fix it, uh, it's very nice uh, to have all of you here. So since we have limited time, uh, let me first request our director, uh, with whom probably all of you want to interact, and so. She's the main attraction here. So please come to the days. Was she? Yeah. So uh, as I had uh, uh, probably informed uh, the main organizers that uh, this particular uh, event is being covered on Zoom, uh, not for these people, they are joining physically, but uh, as I understood that many of the PGDB alumni wanted to join this program uh, to interact, and uh, therefore this is being streamed on Zoom, but still that wouldn't have been probably sufficient uh, because uh, Zoom has a, a, a capacity uh, above which uh, you know, there might be problems if people join. Uh, therefore, this is being streamed live on YouTube. And however, uh, because of some security reasons, on YouTube the chat is disabled. So, uh, what needs to be done is that those who have joined on YouTube uh, probably needs to coordinate with someone in this audience and send the questions to some means like Gmail or something like that. Or uh, if they can join on Zoom and uh, write in the chat box, then it's probably easier to uh, track. So uh, I, I understand that some people in the audience are noting down those things, right? That's what I was told. Um, so uh, that's, that's initially it. Uh, so uh, I request, uh, you know, the, one of the organizers of this program to say a few words first. So we need to probably come here, otherwise the camera will not be So I'm Shivam Verma, the first year student of PGDB Batsar. Now it is a great pleasure to interact with you. We have been in talks with sir for this session. I understand it has been distributed a many times. So it has been a pleasure being studying here and I would request two people, Zoha and uh, and PR presenter to come here and uh, we shall present a book at me now. So We thank you so much for this opportunity. Over to you. Thank you for the book. I was not expecting this. It's always been difficult to carry this. We did not take it for that. Right. 
Yeah, but then there's this problem of these NFTs that you know, I do a choice and then I be accused of bias. That's all the problem. So, um, I think this, I'm making it very informal. So, uh, the students had uh, given me a write up in, you know, outlining their uh, way of conducting this program. Uh, and I shared this uh, with our director, to which she had said that she wanted to, it to be more of an informal uh, interaction rather than a sort of a formal sort of a talk and things like that, which probably was planned. Uh, but what I understood was that uh, the uh, they wanted to hear from you briefly uh, about your journey, like you know, I think. The idea that you know, your background was probably in computer science before that, something else, if people uh, get it up, uh, she probably was student of physics. And then the science, but uh, then became a very uh, sort of distinguished computational biologist. Uh, so it's in the interface, uh, I mean, a very interdisciplinary area that. She works and is an even mark and uh, you know and has been uh, acknowledged by various scientific communities and the government of India uh, uh, for her contributions. So what they wanted to know was uh, this journey briefly about uh, this transition. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, all the PGDB students of the current batch. Uh, it's a pleasure, and when Shola mentioned that the PGDB students want to meet me, uh, there was no way I could say that no, uh, this is not possible, I don't have time or anything, because I always have time for the students. So, uh, the other thing is, it should not have been only me here. Shola is equally accomplished, and we have two very accomplished scientists in our midst here. You've uh, already been in touch, I'm sure, with the Dean of Studies, Professor Devashi Shengupta. Uh, fantastic statistician, but he also has an engineering background, right? Electrical engineering, and then moved on to statistics. Uh, and we have Professor D.P. Prashad Mukherjee here, our deputy director, who is, uh, all of us are very interdisciplinary, right? You are industrial engineering, right? Uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, and then uh, in the fringe area of computer science, we should say, not the very core areas, even me, I was in the fringe area, my research. So it's bordering electrical and uh, computer science, something like that. So it's pattern recognition. I think he did it in image processing. I did it in optimization techniques using uh, some methods which are called evolutionary computing methods. So uh, to tell you about my background, well, I grew up outside Bengal, uh, moving uh, the cities. Uh, I was in, when I was very small, I was in Ramgar, uh, in North Bihar. Then I moved, we moved to uh, Nagpur, where I just started my kindergarten or something, uh, very, very early, uh, not school, even preschool. Then we moved to Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh, where I studied up to class three, and from class three to class eight, uh, up to class two, and from class three to class eight in Jhansi, in Uttar Pradesh. Then my father got transferred to a place where Dharmanga, uh, the school system in which I studied, it did not have an uh, appropriate school uh, in that system. So the choice in that of my parents was to either put me in a hostel in Patna or uh, that I should move to my uh, grandparents' home in very close here, actually, it's in Bali. Bali is just about four kilometers from here, but just across the river in Howrah district. So uh, they chose the second option. I moved on to I moved to my maternal grandparents' house, but my father's original ancestral house and my mother's ancestral house. That's number six and number nine of the same locality. So it's very close. Uh, so I moved there from class eight, uh, middle of class eight, because I have to repeat half of class eight. Uh, because the session that was there outside Bengal and the session in Bengal had a six month difference. So rather than just doing six months of class nine, uh, I repeated six months of class eight. Uh, <clears throat> that was the first time I studied Bengali as a third language because after class eight, uh, we need to take a third language. 
and here it was uh, Bengali. And uh, my teacher, Bengali teacher, was very upset with me that a Bengal, Bengali girl taking Bengali as a third language, she was most upset. She would ask me questions, uh, half of it I could, could answer because Bengali has a very close similarity with uh, Hindi. So, um, but I remember once she asked me the meaning of the word prachir. You know, uh, not many of you would know, those who are Bengali might know. Prachir actually means wall. Okay, but I had, that was the first time I was hearing that word and therefore I did not hear that word. I heard the word prachin, which is old. So I desperately tried answering with my understanding of that word and she was most upset that I had not even heard about the, the word prachir. So anyhow, uh, that's how those six months went. Uh, 11, 12, I moved on to Bethune College. Uh, in Bethune College, it was uh, West Bengal board, which was with the first language Bengali, which is very difficult. But again, the transition uh, happened and happened. Uh, there, were, there were very funny uh, mistakes which I made, uh, especially in the grammar part, because in Bengali, we have something called shamash, which is not there in uh, Hindi, possibly. I don't know, I don't remember if it is there, but it, it is like you have two words which you join and the, uh, the word means something else, right? So it's like uh, Bina Pani, it's neither Bina nor Pani, it's the Saraswati. Huh? So it's something like that. So anyhow, we don't remember, see, I remember, I think it is called Bhubhani Shamash. <laughs> but anyhow, so I managed to class 12th and my paper in class 12th. Of course, the other subjects were uh, okay. I always liked physics and mathematics because these were the two subjects where I did not have to memorize much. While I was terrified of biology, of chemistry, of geography, uh, not that much of geography, but of history, where I had to memorize lots of dates. I liked English in the, the languages. So after 12th, um, I had a choice of going into engineering or into um, uh, doing physics. And at that time, Presidency College, Physics and Presidency College was considered very good. And we had actually the best professors over there, uh, which I did not realize later, I realize now. So um, I chose uh, Presidency College Physics there. It was a fantastic time, first time studying with boys, because I've been in uh, girls' school all my life before that. So, and I realized later on that the girls, boys were also equally terrified of the girls. Like the girls were terrified of the boys, the boys were also equally terrified uh, because they did not know how to speak to girls, especially those who were coming from boys' schools. But uh, somehow, I mean, we mixed well. We had four girls and I think 28 boys in that class. Uh, we had two students who were first, who had come first in high secondary examination in two consecutive years. Our own year, uh, the year that we had passed class 12 and the one before that. And that was, uh, I think, the first time that a girl had come first overall, uh, Roshni Sen, who had stood first in 1980, this was 85, so she had stood first in 1984, high secondary examinations. She uh, spent her time in Adi Kharagpur and finally she did not like it. And then, uh, whatever be the reason, she came and joined our back after dropping one year. So we had two firsts and another person, I think he had, he also had a rank in high secondary, maybe third or something. He is now a well, very well known internationally, I mean, very reputed neuroscientist, I guess. His name is Patro Mitro and we have Mitra's lab in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. It's him. Uh, so three outstanding people in our class and those were a peak. Uh, so, uh, a fully connected sabra which is disconnected from the other parts. Those are outstanding people. And uh, but somehow we actually gelled very well together. I used to play bridge with them, uh, also many other games uh, with the boys and uh, because the girls uh, they were not into too much into uh, too much into these uh, games and things like that. But I always liked games. So that's how the three years of physics um, went. But then I was, uh, it was too theoretical. I was pages after pages of derivation, which was done properly, marks came okay, but uh, I lost the intuition which I had in physics somehow. It was, it was my fault because they were the best of teachers there. Uh, somebody um, 
AKRC or Arun Rai Chaudhuri, Raman Rai Chaudhuri. Yeah, you can find out about Raman Rai Chaudhuri, fantastic work he's done. He's internationally regarded and reputed. But that time I did not realize it. It's only later that I realized what a great personality I had as a teacher. So um, uh, then, then I was looking for a shift. So from computer science, uh, from physics, uh, I came to know that Calcutta University offered uh, a post BSc BTEC in computer science. There was also a BTEC in uh, radio physics and electronics, but I preferred computer science and I made that shift. And I think that was the best move, uh, best academic uh, move that I made because I liked computer science hugely. Um, I enjoyed my three years of BTEC. That was because it's post BSc, so it was three years. Now it is only four years BTEC there um, uh, after joint entrance examination, but still they have a lateral entry in the second year. So I completed that BTEC again. So we were at that point, we knew that we were 10 students and already five. Um, we had, uh, we already had four boys uh, and five girls. I think four boys and five girls, and then somebody called Rudra or Rudra was supposed to come. And we were not sure whether this was going to be a boy or a girl. Finally, it turned out to be a girl. So we had six girls and uh, four boys in the class. So a socially fantastic time I had in Vitek. Uh, at that time, I met my future husband. He was uh, two years my senior, and we shared a very interesting relationship. We always studied. So uh, that was when I was driven to really study hard. Um, so anyhow, I think my academics flourished from BTEC. And uh, then I, after BTEC, there was a huge crisis in my family. So uh, my gate examination, the gate examinations examination you give for entry into intake, that the score was very, very good. I could have got anywhere, but I, I had almost decided not to move out of Kolkata because of the crisis in my family. I did not want to leave my mother and be, and go away. It was my mother who drove me out of the house. Uh, she uh, just wouldn't have it that I would. Uh, I continued my study studies in Calcutta University, but I understood later on that she had asked my friends to get the form just in case I refused to move out. Then at least I would not drop a year. Uh, but uh, again, that force to go to IIT Kharagpur uh, was a fantastic, uh, what should I say, but not a decision because I'm not taken I was that decision was forced onto me, but it was very good. Because had I not moved on to IIT Kharagpur, I would not have realized for the first time in my life what is really, truly hard work and how to enjoy the hard work. I enjoyed every bit of the one and a half years I spent in IIT Kharagpur. It was hugely difficult, uh, very hard work, but I wouldn't say difficult, but very hard work. There were times, at least two to three times in the uh, one and a half years when we had been awake for 48 hours because of the deadline of submission. Uh, so, but that was so enjoyable. Uh, then, of course, I moved to ISI, which was another fantastic institution which I could have entered. It was very close to my home. Uh, the person I did my PhD with, got me into an area which also was flourishing, was starting to flourish at that time. You might know that um, uh, computer science or, or patent recognition, uh, in India, the real patent recognition work first happened in IESA. So around the 1980s, with the knowledge-based computing system, there's a big project. Most of uh, the seed of the work in PR, patent recognition, that happened in IESA. And we had very good people working in pattern recognition and image processing. These were the areas, and these actually have later on uh, what we call data mining, uh, machine learning. But the seed, I would say, in India was in ISI. And I'm sure you all of you know that the first computer in India came to this campus, uh, uh, ISI. Okay, Mohanan which had that vision. So uh, kindly do read up whatever you can about the founder of this institute. And we realized what charisma he had. That in those times when this was more of a like a jungle type, I mean, very few uh, maybe residents were here. But he got the best brains and the topmost people from around the world to this place. So uh, that's something to learn from. 
Anyhow, then uh, of course I've completed my PhD while doing my PhD for six months. I went off to Los Alamos National Laboratory. That's also one of the fantastic experience I had. Los Alamos National Laboratory is one where the atom bomb, all the research for atom bomb was made, uh, was uh, carried out, and all the famous people, uh, physicists and everybody, they were there at, at that point of time before the Second World War. So again, it was a fantastic time, but that was also Los Alamos National Laboratory was the first time uh, my stay there, I realized that I needed people around me to survive. You see, uh, when I was small, when people would come to my home, I would always be busy with my whatever reading, storybooks, whatever, uh, in my own room, while people were there in the house. So I thought I, would, I was very comfortable staying alone. But when I was really alone in Los Alamos National Laboratory, very few people over there, nobody from the family. And at that time, calling home was you have to look at your watch because every minute would cost two dollars. So uh, you would look at your watch and call. Uh, we did not, did not have money uh, at that time, and also two dollars a minute is quite expensive. Now it's absolutely different, right? So anyhow, I uh, completed my PhD, went for a postdoc to uh, University of New South Wales in Sydney, cut it short and came back because I got an offer from my side. And then the uh, rest is one after the other. Uh, whatever happened, happened. Uh, nothing was really planned except that whatever I do, I will try to do it to the best of my ability. Beyond that, nothing was planned. I was never ambitious. Uh, never really set very high goals or anything, but uh, only thing that uh, helped me was that attitude of uh, giving my best to whatever I tried, whatever I tried my hands on, and that's how we are here today. So that is uh, well, not really in brief, but that is what uh, my journey has been. But if you have any questions, of course I would be uh, very happy to answer them. Uh, other than that, anything that I've missed showed up? Yeah. Yes. Oh, shift to computation biology. Yes. So I did my PhD uh, in, uh, as I said, something called genetic algorithms and classification systems. So classification, you must have uh, maybe know by now that you try to find out the decision boundaries. And what we were doing is explicitly finding out the decision boundaries using a search technique called genetic algorithms. Now, after PhD, then I moved on from this classification is supervised classification. Design and classifiers is supervised. You need a training data. Okay, so data sets where the class labels are known. Now, what happens when you don't know the class labels? You just have the data points and you are asked to find some patterns in the data. Then essentially, or very, very often, the first thing that you do is you try to group the data points. Uh, based on some measure of similarity, uh, you try to figure out which are the data points which stick together, which are very similar to each other, which are uh, different clusters. So essentially clustering. And clustering problem, uh, at that time people were using genetic algorithms for clustering, but what they were doing, you see genetic algorithms is a metaheuristic technique, it's a search and optimization technique where uh, so you do not work directly with the parameters, but you work with the uh, coding of the parameters. So suppose you are trying to figure out the optimum, or suppose f of, uh, there's a function f of x, y, and z. Okay, so there you want to find the minimum or the maximum of f uh, for some particular x, y, z values. Now, uh, genetic algorithm, in genetic algorithm, what you will do is you will encode these, the x, y, and z in a string-like structure, which, uh, which could be a binary string where you might decide that, okay, the first eight bits will represent x, the next eight bits will represent y, and the next eight bits will represent z. So 24-bit long string, and you know the, the, the range in which x, and x, y, and z will vary. So within that, you try to find out where f will attain its let's say maximum. So that's, uh, there are operation steps in genetic algorithms which will help you find out that the x star, y star, and z star, where f will take its maximum value. Now, uh, so what essentially in clustering people were doing at that time, they were look, they were, uh, they were encoding each point of the data set as one entry in that string. So suppose your string, uh, your data set had thousand points, 
you wanted to cluster thousand data points. So your genetic algorithm that string, which is because it is genetic algorithm, it's, those strings are called chromosomes. Each the chromosome would be thousand long, thousand bit long chromosomes. Now suppose you had one million data points, then the chromosome would become one million long, right? And then it's very difficult to handle such systems. So the, the, then what the new thing that we brought about at that time was that okay, let us not encode each um, data point as a, as a position in the string, but let us encode the centers of the clusters in that chromosome. So immediately the size of the chromosome comes down, but the search space is now much larger because now it's real numbers that you're dealing with, okay? So the operators have to be redefined, theoretical proofs have to be given, etc. But that actually uh, turned out to be a very good idea. So to encode the cluster centers rather than the data points. Now it seems very obvious, but when we did it, it was uh, it was one of the first things which came up, uh, and that paper actually cited very heavily. It's uh, I don't know maybe now it's about 1800 citations of that paper. So uh, that turned out to be a very good work. And then I was continuing like that with okay, a single objective genetic algorithm where you had very optimized just a single objective. You wanted to improve that objective as much as possible. Now, suppose you have a multi objective optimization problem, right? You have three different objectives which you want to simultaneously optimize, but the problem is such that if you want to optimize one, the other becomes bad, right? Suppose you, are, you want to go from point X to point Y, and you have two objectives you want to optimize the time and the cost. Now, you try to reduce time. Cost will go up. You try to reduce cost, time will go up. So this is a typical example where the objectives conflict with each other. There's no single solution which will give you the best values of all the objectives. How do you tackle such problems? Now, it's not the first time that people have looked at these problems. Multi-objective problems have been there for ages. Usually what people do is they take a weighted summation of the objectives and turn that multi-objective problem into a single objective problem and do it. Solve it. But again, the weighted weights, how do you know what the weights should be? And there are different other problems with that approach. So then came up multi objective optimization um, problem and genetic algorithms for multi objective optimization. And the clustering problems could be also posed in multi objective framework. So we went about one, one step after the other. First, single objective genetic algorithms for clustering where the number of clusters is known. Then multi-objective genetic algorithm for clustering where the uh, number of clusters is known. Single objective genetic algorithm for clustering when the class number of clusters is not known. And so on and so forth. So step after step, this work progressed. I had PhD students who were doing this work, etc. Around 2004 5 I got a student. So we were working in clustering and I got a student who was a biology student. And uh, he convinced me that many of the methods that we were developing had new applications in biology. And I was, as I said, terrified of biology. So in my school days, every time I had a biology test, uh, one, when I was coming back from my school, just when I turned the last crossing to my home, I would start crying because I had to respond to my mother. And that's how the test went. And every time I would tell her that uh, the next time it will be better. It never became better, but uh, again, going back to biology, I was really terrified. But it so happened that, I mean, it was nice to have, this is where the students actually uh, helped. So the student taught me biology, I start, taught the student computer science, and that, that's how it went. Every day, I would, he would teach me what is a gene, what is a DNA, what is you know, a chromosome, and uh, what makes up the DNA, etc., etc. And uh, I would forget. And then he would reteach me. So that went on uh, about one year. It required for me to for everything to stick in my mind. But with the help of uh, YouTube and all these videos, now it has become uh, quite easy to you know see things happening in front of you. Right? And uh, that way you remember also quite a bit. So, uh, but what I did was while I was making this uh, this change from into biology into biological data analysis. My uh, clustering work, I started applying to biological data sets and something called gene expression data sets. There's a huge amount of application of clustering in gene expression data sets. Okay, and gene expression means 
you see, you have uh, every cell of the body has many genes. Human, cell, human cells have of the order of 20,000 genes. So what is the expression is genes uh, are responsible for creating another molecule which are called messenger RNAs. So the amount of messenger RNA that a gene produces is called the expression of that gene. Okay. So now if you have many genes, you measure the expression values of all these genes and it has biological significance where you want to cluster the genes based on their expression variation over time, let's say. So this gene, uh, the same gene in the morning will have certain expression, in the afternoon will have certain expression and so on. Or when certain biological process, let's say cell division is happening, at different points of time, it will have different expression values. You take a medicine uh, before that and after that and sometime after that, gene expression will change. So over time, you can have different, uh, uh, this expression value going up and down, just like time series, okay? like just like stock prices or anything. So their clustering was important. And I already had clustering methods ready. So I made that shift while applying these methods to gene expression clustering. So what the good thing that which happened is that my publication record did not take a break. Okay, there was no break in the publication record because I was applying those methods in gene expression data clustering or other clustering problems in biology while I was learning the biology. Very often when you make this shift, then there seems you often get a break in the publication record okay, because you are learning then new things. But that fortunately did not happen. And then I moved on to something called microRNA, which is a small molecule which is which seems to be implicated in many different diseases. Right? In particular, in cancer, in different types of cancer, the level of the microRNAs uh, in the in the diseased tissue, vis-a-vis -vis the normal tissue, there's a change in that level. So it is important to be able to detect those changes, to important to be able to detect which are the microRNAs which show a significant change from normal to diseased tissues. Because then you can you you infer that probably this these microRNAs uh, could be playing a role in that particular cancer type. And that's how markers, gene markers are identified, and that's how we actually identified some markers, which uh, we published, I and mean, we did some literature survey and literature validation, etc. on that, but um, it, it then depends on the collaboration that you have with the wet lab experts. Okay, they will now take it up and try to uh, try to establish in the laboratory whether these genes or these microRNAs are indeed uh, playing a role in that particular cancer type. So some of our results have been validated by independent groups uh, elsewhere. But uh, that's how I made the move, as I so sure had asked, from computer uh, and pure um, computer science in the sense that we were, I was doing pattern recognition and data mining to uh, computational biology. Right, and uh, computational biology gave me that uh, good feeling also because you can always feel uh, what your result, what implication your result might have. So often you see when you are trying to understand the disease, it is important through analytic methods to be able to understand the molecular basis of that disease. Because only if you understand the disease, you have a hope of attacking that disease, of curing that disease, or whatever. So therapy will come up only after you understood what are the molecules which are involved. And it is in this understanding that methods from computer science, from statistics, models from mathematics, etc., they play a huge, huge role. So that is what I've been doing for the last uh, 15, 20 years now. I continue working in uh, optimization. I uh, recently, about well, two years back, a student get, uh, graduated who came up with new methods of multi-objective optimization. Because you see, multi-objective optimization, suppose you have three objectives, it's, it's relatively easier to handle. But if you have 30 objectives, then it becomes a many objective optimization, it's much more difficult to solve. Uh, so, so that's how we continue working. Uh, we are working also on something called <coughs> graph neural networks these days. <coughs> So graph neural networks is also very interesting. Uh, here what happens is, you see, you have a graphical data, right? So you have graphs, nodes, and edges. But you have, let's say, 
classifiers, you have very nice uh, classification methodologies, etc., clustering methods, etc. But those require the data points in real space. Okay. But graphs, again, graphs, uh, you cannot really do, apply a, a base classifier or some other classifier or something uh, in, on graphical data as it is. So from graph neural net, um, the, in, in GNNs, what you do is from the graph, you figure out an embedding of the nodes. Embedding in a space such that in the graph, if two nodes are relatively close to each other, then let's say node X and Y and node X and Z. Okay, X and Y, is one hop away from each other and x and z are five hops away let's say then in that embedded in that space when you when you do the embedding x and y will be closer to each other than x and z so uh, with that embedding once you do that embedding you can learn that embedding once you do that then again you can now apply whatever method uh, you favor right uh, whichever classifier whichever clustering method you want to you're comfortable with you can apply it there uh, even the deep learning method now you must have heard about deep learning, uh, CNNs, and uh, many other. And now research is moving towards more explainable AI, uh, especially in the clinical domains. Uh, if you just tell the clinician, okay, so this person has cancer, so, oh yeah. Or if you work, you may wonder why is the system telling me that this person has cancer and that person or this stage of the cancer? So explainability is becoming more and more important. And deep data explainable AI is uh, a very important area of research. Also, ethical AI, uh, ethics in AI. That's also very important. You must have seen that uh, very often the data has biases. Okay, so um, biases not because of the programmer's uh, fault, because the data is like that. If you are collecting um, like uh, data of let's say doctors, uh, you will find that a large majority would be males. Uh, so uh, the data naturally has a bias. And uh, so then the classifier will also give a biased uh, output. So how do you um, remove such biases from the systems? Uh, these are important things which uh, our people are working nowadays. And, and also, because that's a very great concern I see that whether AI will replace all of us, whether um, AI will destroy the world, and so on and so forth. So even today, I had a visitor who was asking me this question that with all these advancements, uh, will it destroy the very human being which created AI? So I don't know. First of all, I hope not. Secondly, and thirdly, uh, whatever happens, you cannot stop this flow of research. Research will continue. People will be curious to see new and new and new things happening. This like flow of water, you cannot stop it. It will find its work. Okay. Only thing is, then comes the regulations and things like that which you put in place and try to uh, see that wrong usage is not happening. So anyhow, uh, floor is open for questions. If you have any any questions, but it is uh, I must say I'm very very thankful to all of you that uh, we have we are having this conversation so <clears throat> open the also questions uh, just before that uh, just, uh, just a side issue i just remember maria said you can not do that thing and should be thinking of script anything with legacy uh, I don't know whether many of you know that your you know usually it's, it's usually not the case. You can be proud that you're sitting on the top of a dinosaur. Do you know that? <laughs> this is usually you know very few people have the privilege of doing that. Uh, but I had uh, totally forgotten about this, so I apologize. I thought that you know before this program I would make arrangements so that you go and see the dinosaur, which is just below us. Uh, but before we leave, please remind me uh, that uh, we will arrange a visit to the Jolo territory. The other place where you would have been very interesting is the place where Mahavish lived, but that building is probably not uh, in right shape. And if three of you visit together, you know, there might be problems right now. So uh, it's been renovated. It's probably having come a year later, probably better. 
Uh, but uh, you know, you can always visit us after. Otherwise, uh, we'll leave by seven. But uh, but now let's uh, open the floor for questions. So, uh, someone needs a mic, right? A mic. Yeah, so uh, just, just a second, I think uh, this needs to be turned, the camera needs to be turned. Right. And also please introduce yourself. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, just a second, just a second. Yeah. Everyone is in the next room. So please, if you could okay. just stand up a little bit so that you know. Move this slightly more. Angle is different. You get changed. It's the other way around. Just a second. I think it's still not. No, it's not. No, Easier would be where you should not use statistics, and there are probably uh, probably no area where you should not because these days every area has so much of data. Every area, ah, so you would know that. Uh, yeah? So even uh, when analyzing Rohit uh, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Shona. Uh, there's a thesis uh, in ISI with the application of statistics there. So uh, literature, languages, uh, whichever you can think of the area, and all the sciences, with technology, any there, a huge amount of data everywhere. So statistics is uh, required everywhere these days. Just like about uh, 10, 20 years back, uh, we had this IT boom and everybody had to learn computers, right? At least the basic level. From Learning computers and actually studying computers, these are two different things, right? And we learn how to operate a computer, how to do some, some basic level of coding. So that everybody was learning, right? And these days, uh, everybody must learn, to my understanding, must learn some basic statistical methods um, and learn it properly. Otherwise, uh, in any domain, you are applying different methods, but that application may, uh, um, unless that understanding of that method is correct, your application may not be correct. Huh? So you might be doing something and then wondering why result nahi aaya hai. Because uh, the application is not proper, the way that it should be. The, uh, for example, you are using a method which requires a real data, while your data is not real. The data is a categorical data or something like that. In the real space, I mean. So, then those methods are not going to work. But your understanding has to be. So uh, I think uh, these days, uh, every course, every program will or uh, needs to have a basic understanding of some statistical methods, the basic levels. Of course, those who are studying statistics will do much more than that. But everybody else, 
just like mathematics, statistics, and computers, computers, some amount of that has to be there everywhere. And applications of statistics everywhere, where in climate change, in um, wherever you can think of, in uh, biology, in social sciences. Um, as I said, as uh, Shorab already pointed out, we are sitting on top of a, of a dinosaur. So, uh, I mean, there also, there are different, uh, these measurements of the bones, etc., they actually, I understand, give rise to uh, new studies in statistics because the data provided newer challenges. Existing methods were not able to solve it. These days, we have tons and tons of data with uh, most of us doing some, uh, you know, tweaking of the algorithms in order to be able to apply the methods on those data sets. But uh, there's a remarkable lack of, uh, what should I say, statistically uh, sound methods. Okay, we are doing some empirical alpha, beta, gamma, karke, karke, we are doing it. But um, for example, if you think of deep learning, the theoretical foundation of deep learning is not that great yet. So people need to come in there, develop the uh, theory behind all these methods, which apparently seem to be working. Hmm. Can I add something to what our director said? So uh, one which is uh, the question that you asked, I think there are two points to it. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, probably over the years, obviously biology, as the director said, that you know, 30 years back, probably people didn't even think that there would be quantitative aspects of biology would require this much of statistical and computational uh, sort of expertise to really understand the biology. But over the years, things have changed that for a proper understanding of any science, uh, you need uh, a sort of understanding the quantitative aspects of that particular branch of science. Now, that has now spread to humanities also. And uh, if you look at things like courses like political science or even history, you find that there are a lot of quantitative aspects that are being studied in terms of game theory uh, because these often involve strategic moves. And so to determine that which strategy is better, uh, to look at those historical perspectives and look at that data, those sort of game theory models are being developed. Options. There are lots of applications. Uh, but the other point being is that you see to, un to realize the full potential of statistics, it's the other branches uh, which also have to appreciate the use of statistics. Often, you know, we are very conservative in nature. Society is also very conservative. We really don't want to change. So the fact being that there's been a compartmentalization of you know, mathematics and non-mathematical subjects uh, for which you know, things might be changing, but you know, traditionally what has been is that people who like mathematics go in one direction, people who don't like mathematics go in some other direction. That sort of an attitude might change. There needs to be more interdisciplinary stuff to understand the full potential of Anything that you do, whether it's in social sciences or in other uh, physical or biological sciences. Yes. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, how there seems to be a risk between the mathematical and non mathematical subjects. And do uh, you think there could be? Some quality of the humanities which cannot be fully quantified, or do you think a perfect understanding of statistical methods in humanities is possible? Uh, is there something that cannot be modeled in humanities? Some parts in literature which you just appreciate, which cannot be understood. Are you asking me this question? Uh, so, we, I, I don't know what sort of things you have already covered in the statistical course, but you must have learned that statistics is something when we try to explain a response to certain variables, there are certain aspects, certain variables which are actually, which are called explanatory variables, and then there is something called errors. So, errors are things which you cannot explain through the variables which you have already potentially identified as prospective explanatory variables. There are the other explanatory variables which we have not 
You see, the way statistical methods go, you cannot look into the dark looking for factors. It means a factor, if you identify a factor, you can probably test whether that's a good explanatory variable for the response that you're looking at. So whatever is not being explained is the error. Now, whether everything can be explained directly, I possibly think it's still very difficult to answer this because had that been done, there's a slight difference between statistics and mathematics where you have an exact equation where, you know, given these things, uh, you have a perfect sort of a response. But we, even what we have found is that given a certain uh, set of explanatory variables whose values are same in two individuals, the responses are different. So there must be some other sort of uh, variables which we have still not identified, uh, which could explain that. But I think it would be difficult to say that, you know, where you can get a perfect vector of variables which would completely characterize a human. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, actually, I am asking this question on behalf of the CG. He is also a PG degree graduate from our first batch. What he wants to know is that uh, what are the research prospects after doing PG degree uh, from uh, after doing PG degree and doing in this case and having to work up after some years? So, research prospects, uh, I don't think they reduce in any way after doing PG degree. It uh, depends on your interest, but PGDBA has already given you an exposure to different facets. Uh, you see, you get the statistical and mathematical um, what should I say, perspective uh, from ISI. You get the technological perspective from IIT Kharagpur. You get the management perspectives, business perspectives from uh, IIM. In any of these directions, you can take your research. So it depends on your interest, but it would be probably natural for a PGDB student to work more on applied research, right? Because you have seen the applications, because you may have a particular mindset where uh, that is why you enter the PGDB course, because you uh, want more hands on. So uh, maybe you would be interested more in application oriented research. It could be uh, any policy research and the uh, the country needs very good policy makers and that has to be you know, very theoretically and uh, scientifically sound policies. So uh, that could be area, but there are different areas. I mean, you can go into whichever area you want to. Uh, <clears throat> another thing I think PGDBA students, besides research, because of your particular um, knack, you might also look at entrepreneurship at some point of time. I, I always tell my students, um, many students these days, those who can, it's not for everybody. Not everybody would be willing to take that chance because it's a highly risky proposition, right? But there are many students these days who wish, want to take that risk. So take it if you can, because you are some of the best that this country has. And if you can generate jobs, nothing like it. Now, most of us are job seekers. If you can be job givers, that would be fantastic. And this country needs a lot of such entrepreneurs these days because you see all these jobs and government giving jobs, etc. That prospect, that that uh, possibilities are reducing it by the day. So why not? Uh, so those are different. And PGDBA has actually given you a, a very good polish. Now wherever you want to polish, flourish. The only thing is nothing will come without hard work. That is that is uh, absolutely must. I mean, it goes without saying. Nothing will come. So uh, I have a question. Why do I see so few girls in this class? Just a question. I mean, what do you think? What, what do the girls think? Why are there? Because I can see only one, two, three, maybe four here, five here, six, six, maybe, maybe just so, one of I think there are six. Six, six of them. Yeah? So uh, what is the girls' perspective? Why are so few girls? Here? Required in a company to there are only six girls out of 15 students in our class. And in our kindergarten, there were around two girls out of 16. So the ratio has always been such a huge. The reason is definitely there are some food suppliers. But the reason is not by design, right? It is by chance that it is like this. Uh, 
because the tests are the same for everybody. There is no bias working here uh, in the selection process, is there? <laughs> so, that's that's the uh, we have to see to it that I don't have the figures right now. I should have collected these figures. I think from the application profile, it's not somewhere 50 50. So, the question of you see, let's assume that you know it's equally likely for males and females to get in here, but the issue is that among the applicants, I don't think it's a 50 50 uh, sort of a breakup. So, so it's more a question of less, you know, less people, less females apply. So we got one perspective from what's her name? Shambhavi. 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 Okay. Any other girl wants to add on to that perspective? I mean, not just repeating that, but anything new you want to say to girls, or it's more or less the same, uh, same uh, sort of view that you have. What about the boys? Why do you think there are so few girls? Yes. Uh, uh, we no, no, take the mic, take the mic, otherwise those listening to you online. Yeah. Um, uh, we all are engineers, we all come from engineering background. So in our engineering colleges also the same ratio are there. So I think more or less uh, uh, while coming to this course, the same ratio has been replicated. So I think the problem starts from that, that stage only. Okay. So, but uh, the same question remains, why? So I think uh, we need to first uh, think why less people come in, less uh, number of girls come in engineering. So I think that is connected to the, I think uh, that the uh, societal setup that, is, that uh, uh, girls will not go into the engineering and they will take their medical field or commerce. And I think it starts from there itself. Sure. So it's nothing, uh, I think, PGD very specific, but uh, it starts from beginning itself. No, I understand perfectly that this is not PGD very specific. It is there in all our, our classes, in fact. Most of our classes, not all, I would say. I think in this theory, it is different, but uh, most of the classes. Now, I have another question for you, for the boys, actually. And later on, I'll come back to the girls. Unless you have some questions, because I'm usurping your prerogative. Now I start. I started asking questions. So uh, give me one thing that you think you think personally that uh, it might change. It might bring about some change at the society because you finally said it's a society problem. Huh? So social problem. Yes, so one thing because there are there might be hundreds of things, but tell me one thing which you consider to be very important in order to rectify this situation. Your thoughts. Then I think uh, the support of family and uh, I think. Uh, uh, okay, support of family, uh, that's fine. So now I have, because you said support of family. So another question related. Will you support, suppose your sister, or when you marry, I don't know whether you're married or not, when you marry your wife or your partner, because we don't know where the world is headed. These days, uh, you know, uh, in India we still call husband, wife and everything. There are many countries where they call partner. Huh? So whatever it is. To me, everything is I mean, it's okay. So will you, uh, suppose you were faced with that situation, would you? First of all, I am not married. Okay. <laughs> Neither do you have a partner. No? <laughs> that is your, your personal information. That's what it is. <laughs> confidential information. Don't have to say that. But given that I am faced in such a situation, I am definitely a support. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, the females need to be exposed to the idea at the very beginning of their, uh, very beginning True. when they are schooling that uh, they can do this, they can do this. <laughs> Actually, at uh, this beginning, they are, they are being fed that uh, you have to go in this area. And so, uh, yeah. how that uh, their mentality becomes like that. Yeah. So, when it comes to them to choose that, uh, it is not really their decision. So, I think there is some inherent bias in that. So it's a, it is a process that starts from very early. So that is what I think. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm asking because we have International Women's Day tomorrow. Join the program online or physically. If there's space, then join physically. If not, join online. But your exams are there. Your exams come first before <laughs> anything else. But if you have prepared, uh, and exams never take stress. 
too much stress. Huh? So that is one thing is very important. Never take too much stress, but uh, be very sincere and committed to whatever you do. Huh? So any other, any other, uh, yes. One, uh, loud, loud, because there are other people online. But one idea which I have, uh, why you have to let women are there self specifically because there are less number of role models available for them. Like for us, I think, Sudha Pichai, we have a lot of male specific uh, uh, role models, but uh, I cannot uh, right now remember even anyone with, who, who is in STEM. So I think... Step, uh, you mean STEM, but entrepreneur? Because you mentioned female, so you have many. But uh, those were like so you mentioned Sundar Pichari, that is why I'm saying in, in, in industry. Yes, ma'am. In industry. Entrepreneur in STEM. Yeah, entrepreneur in STEM. So Kiran Mazumdar Shah, for example, is by from founder CEO. Uh, so I mean there are, but yes, you are right. Very good. Very good. Very good. So I think with increasing number of role models, there will be definitely a more bias to the True. But do you appreciate that? Once this, uh, you know, firmly and forever, the girls' mindsets change. They have enough role models, and they decide that okay, they have to get into all these careers, etc. And, and the girls here, this need not be told because they have that mindset. I'm saying in general. But do you realize that once that changes, that mindset change happens, the men. Would have to would have to let go of a lot of things that they now take for granted. Do you realize that the society, the system, the family system may become destabilized? From what we understand these days, till these days, it's already quite unstable now. But it's going to become more and more until and unless again you see this, there's this Nash equilibrium, ah, Nash equilibrium and game theory. So you move from one stable state to another stable state, but the in between, you have a lot of uh, instability. And to be honest, I think rather than uh, becoming unstable, it will be more less dominated by men and more towards the equilibrium that should be there with the women. But that means a lot of acceptance from those who Absolutely. have. Huh? Right. So the girls there, uh, your views on this particular aspect, unless you have something else to say, you're most welcome. Hold it closer to your mouth. Uh, and maybe there might be an issue of safety that the family thinks uh, when 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 women they go out to study or something. That's my point of view. Like, sure. So I'll tell you a story. You are absolutely right. This safety issue is there in the parents' mind quite high, and that is why uh, they don't let the girls go far distances or at odd hours for tuition and all these things. Uh, so. Uh, these days with the joint entrance examination and that is what many many students take uh, because ISI examination not much tutoring can help right so uh, that's my understanding that's our understanding but uh, joint entrance examination people do take a, a lot of tutorial courses etc and you those could be far away from home at odd hours where the girls get disadvantaged and that is why uh, IITs these days have come up with the super library concept so that is one way of tackling the problem. Uh, there might be other ways, but yes, safety is a big concern, I know, of the parents, and rightly so, it's not a uh, disgrace. But there's this one anecdote I remember. Uh, it's about, uh, 
Hey, good. If I'm uh, if I'm off the mark, please excuse me. But it could give you the feeling what I want to convey. Uh, I think it was Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, uh, in whose term, in some part of the city, it had become very very unsafe for the girls to go. And they were going. Uh, I mean, they were facing trouble there. Very grave troubles. Troubles. So the cabinet ministers they advised the prime minister that okay um, after sunset put a curfew on the girls' movement in that area. So she said, well it's the boys who are creating the trouble. So we will have a curfew for the boys in that area. So we will not allow boys after sunset in that area. So what we tend to do is those who are uh, those who are facing harassment we try to protect them by putting them inside the house which is not the correct solution, I'm sure. But what is the correct solution? I think the only correct solution is education. A lot of education, uh, educating the girls, educating the boys. And I hope all of you will play your role in propagating that education because you've been exposed up to a certain level uh, to this fact of life. But as I said, it would not be easy because you would have to let go of many uh, many things that you take for granted. For example, when we were small, when we went back home from school or any, um, ha having a mother in the house was taken for granted. These days, all the children of the future will not have the mother waiting at home, right? And that the family has to accept. That the family has to accept uh, that mother will not be there. When husband returns, wife will not be there. So these things one has to accept. And accept without grudge. Because if you think that you are allowing your sister, you are allowing your wife, you are allowing your daughter to work, who are you to allow? Nobody has that right to allow or not allow. I mean, that's an inborn right that the women have. But our society says that, yes, we have. Till now, we say that, oh, God, that chai allow her so, but that is fine, that is fine. I mean, things will not change magically. But anyhow, let alone now the question of uh, International Women's Day tomorrow, unless you have something to say. Yes, please. Thank you, Mark. Yes, and last question. Like, I would think of uh, two more reasons. Like, basically, the mindset of the family, that if it is a girl like them, they are to be married to, you know, that's the name. Okay, so they would be posted and don't encourage them to take like that. Especially, I have seen my first email. Uh, and if they are not allowed, then actually they are like, they are not even allowed to take the same job. That kind of mental they have. And the second thing is like, the uh, next uh, kind of, you know, like, boys, they have to be the breadwinner of the family, and so they have the innate pressure that he has to perform, he has to study, and he has to get a job. Girls is like, it's fine. That kind of a societal kind of a. Uh, right. So I think these are the two reasons. No, certainly. Uh, absolutely. You are correct that from a young age, it's expected of a boy that he be the uh, bread earner and of a girl that she will make home, make the home. Uh, that is expected. You are true. You, are, you said and uh, you use the word pressure. There's a pressure on the boys. It is indeed a pressure on the boys. And once girls also learn to take that pressure from a, that, uh, then they will also feel that pressure. Yeah, because it's it's not easy. The uh, entire family is looking up to you to, to be the breadwinner. That's a pressure which is quite hard. And uh, that pressure should come on the girls also. Because the, till now, whatever we think is the girl should be able to, should be financially independent to be able to take care of herself. No, the, I mean, the boys are expected to take care of the family. So the really, girls will be expected to take care of the family and there should be nothing great about that. So that is what, I mean, that is a pressure. Of, uh, many girls might think that, oh, I'm um, not going to get it. That's fine. But also, pressure is not so much. But I think this this, this will uh, stabilize over time. It, it needs time and understanding, like many of you seem to have. That's so fantastic. Uh, anything else or any other topic? So, um, this is changing family dynamics and more and more families are more nuclear and less young. And uh, with uh, with the dynamics of the home also changing. How, uh, how do you think uh, our families will look like in the future? And uh, so, would it more result in 
we're going to get in more and more hyperdata from um, yes yes of course i think so Yes, you're right. I think it is going to be, um, I don't know that how that, that stable state will look like. I really don't know. But there is going to be, it, it is going to be remarkably different from what we have grown up with. But many of us, and uh, maybe to a large extent, all of you also have grown up with, uh, 20, 30 years down the line, it will be quite different. Uh, maybe the children will suffer, I don't know, but I hope not. I hope not. Because uh, some, something else will come up, I'm sure. Something else will come up uh, of, uh, of tackling that issue. That's a great social science issue, probably. And we, I might not be very equipped to answer that question. I know that there, there's going to be quite a lot. It's going to be quite a lot different. But um, one thing what I was thinking is, um, so technology often uh, comes to the rescue. So I remember when it was, uh, my son was at that time eight or nine years old, okay? And I had gone on Humboldt Fellowship to Germany uh, and uh, to a place called Saarbrücken with my son. He was with me. Uh, my husband was supposed to join a month later because he's also, he was also a Humboldt Fellow, but he would go to some other city, Heidelberg, and I was in Saarbrücken, not very far. But he was to come to Germany one month later. And during that time, when I was with my son, and only the two of us were there, I had some work for which I had to leave for some time. And I couldn't take my son along. So what to do? Then, uh, by that time, of course, technology was quite advanced. So I made my uh, husband sit, at, sit in India. And uh, at, uh, online, he, was, he continued speaking with my son, talking to him, keeping him engaged, so that he doesn't do anything, uh, and he doesn't get into trouble. While I went uh, very quickly, within an hour I was back, but one hour he engaged my son. Um, but these things probably more and more will become very, uh, very useful. And uh, these days, uh, maybe in the years to come, this virtual reality will become so much real that we don't know how the world uh, 20 years down the line will look like. And these innovations, I mean, it's, it's going at a mind-boggling pace, right? With now quantum computing and everything, that's uh, the entire paradigm probably is going to shift because now with quantum computing, you must be knowing a lot, uh, quite a bit, and uh, the entire world is in a race to build the build the proper quantum computer. Uh, India is also um, actually investing quite heavily on quantum computing, quantum information. There's a national mission uh, on quantum technologies. So these things will totally change the way we, uh, it's very difficult to predict how this technology will move. And uh, because these days, you see, we have the entire world in this, um, in this small uh, smartphone, which uh, 20 years back, uh, it, was, it was very difficult to even imagine that what communication technology will do for us. So, uh, yeah, yes, I think uh, the, it's, it's difficult to say how the families of future will look like, but it's going to be very different, no doubt. Oh. Yes, something. So this is just an interesting thing I'd like to share from what the director said. So this is my personal experience. This is around 10 years back. Uh, my son was uh, one year and one month old. And my wife, who's a virologist, uh, she had to part of her uh, you know, she was carrying out some work, but some of the experiments she could not do it in Kolkata. So this was in a collaboration with a, a, a lab in uh, Lyon in France. Uh, and it's very important to carry out the experiment, otherwise, you know, there was this sort of a thing that had to be done at that time. And the mindset is very interesting that, you know, I had problems, she had to go, and uh, it's just that I also had a visit planned in France uh, sometime, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, she could not have taken my son with her. And the plan was that I would take my son uh, and then we would be joining in France. Uh, so I had problems even at 
the uh, visa French consulate here because they were probably not used to this sort of a thing that a father is carrying a, 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 a child of that age alone. Uh, I think that was probably something unheard of. Uh, of course, that was the first step. And then even in the Air India flight, I had problems because the air hostess were very surprised that such a thing was happening. So the very fact that a father is carrying his uh, son who's you know, son or daughter, whoever is that young, that is probably, it's not only that we think that this might be that this is a problem of mindset in India or in Asian countries, that's not so. It's it's, it's, it's yeah. throughout the world that I think that's an issue. Uh, Sanjeev, that's not the When you say joint family, you probably mean that in one particular generation, the siblings staying together. So you have uncles, aunts, and things like that. Now, staying together, someone is compromising somewhere. I think the issue is who does that. Very different that uh, I try to convince that do not regiment 
what should be done and what should not be done with that data. Put it there. Let people, let the students work with that. Whatever they want to do, let that be done. That's how the first part country then a lot of good things happen through those such me mechanisms. So you're right, data, whichever field you want to you want to point out in India, getting adequate data is a problem. Uh, and we have to rectify that. At least in biology, I know that the process is on. In other areas, I am not sure. But uh, you may be knowing that ISI is funded by the government of India through a ministry called Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. If you go to their website, you will find a lot of data which is there, which is of course data related to surveys and all these things, which is what must be collects, must be Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. So, if you are interested, you can actually look at that data, you can download that data, you can work with that data, and if you come up with very interesting observations, uh, I'm sure there will be takers for that. You have to get in touch with, maybe uh, for you, it would be one of us, and uh, some of us, if that is an interesting observation which you come up after analyzing the data, we can pass it on to the government, the people uh, who might make use of that observation. But uh, feel free to look up the MUSPI website. A lot of data is available there. Including all these indicators, um, many indicators which are there, all these values are available there. Mm -hmm. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my name is Rohit Lu. I'm a, I don't, I'm a former employee at oil and gas company. So man, uh, nowadays it is a very uh, well known verse that uh, data is the new oil. So man, my question is that uh, history repeats itself. So when oil was early, uh, when earlier days oil was discovered, it was only used for uh, speed lamps and all the sort of it. But as soon as the industrial revolution came, and we actually in the world war, when the true potential of oil has been discovered in motor vehicles, its use has been ex exponentially increased. And now we are, we are seeing that it is almost exhausted. I mean, down that 20 years, we will exhaust all of our oil resources. Now, I see a similar pattern in data as well. We took a long time to generate all those data that we are now exploring. And right now, the data generation speed is outsmarting our computational power because the fastest computer now we have is not as fast as the other computer. So, now my question is when we overcome our computational speed, so is there any chance that we will exhaust our data? Exhaust our data? That we have generated so far. No, no, because uh, okay. so unlike oil, unlike oil which is sort of, uh, the quantity is fixed, this natural resource, this, this particular resource, even the sun's energy for example, that's, that's fixed. Sometime it will run out. Huh? But data, I mean, as long as we live, the data con is continuously getting generated. So that, I don't think, is going to run out. What we are going to run out is the ways of analyzing the data, and that's where the training that you've got, that's where it comes in very handy. I mean, you are absolutely beautifully equipped to be able to handle that data. I mean, data generation is not a problem. Uh, these days, even data storage is not that much of a problem. Storage prices are so low now. But what is the bottleneck is data scientists. I and mean, we call it data scientists, but essentially people who are equipped with the correct skills to analyze that data. So uh, that's where you come in. I mean, um, I don't think we are going to run out of data. Do you have any such uh, fear of running out of data? I don't think we are going to run out of data uh, per se. that uh, three top institutes uh, complementary expertise. So this course, the students of this course 
are getting to learn the correct thing from the correct people. Okay, every institute has its strengths. So uh, it is uh, it is like all the strengths coming together in one place. Hmm? If I ISI wanted to teach management and uh, IIM wanted to teach, um, maybe we can, but that will be not our strengths. So this is like uh, that um, Durga giving, being given weapons by the people who have those strengths. So you are like our Durga. Ah, so you must behave like one. But uh, anyhow, this is a very, um, this is a program worth emulating. And I think uh, in this, uh, there, is a, there is an acknowledgement that this is a beautiful program and people in other institutions are trying to collaborate to uh, bring their strengths together so that the student has the best learning experience. And uh, so uh, at this point, yes, the, um, uh, this course uh, itself, starting from 2015, 22 now, you, you will be passing out in 20, uh, no, there's a, you are in the first year. So there's a batch which will be graduating in 2022, seven years already, seven uh, years, six years have already graduated. No, that's not correct. Five, uh, four. Five years. <laughs> Whatever. So uh, this is the seventh batch, correct. So um, at this point, we are continuing in the way it is um, because it, that's already very, uh, very good and also very challenging. That uh, you know, three institutes with different rules and different uh, regulations, etc., sitting together, thrashing out the differences. It's quite challenging. So we have managed to now through very good understanding between the three institutes, the colleagues of the three institute. Uh, so that is um, that is how it is going to remain at least for a few more years. Uh, but of course, we have to see how where the world is headed, and we have to update uh, this course more and more. And about um, uh, what was the other question you had, vision and some suggestions about the PDBA passouts? I mean, that we already discussed, sort of, because yeah, you are sort of uh, equipped to go anywhere you want to. You can go into research, you can go into um, industry, you can go into uh, your own business, your own startups. I think you are very well placed to uh, do whatever you wish to. And uh, from ISI, because uh, IITs, etc., they have. Start, they have their startup cultures quite a bit. ISI, we are still not that in, not into that mode uh, very well yet. But I would hope that uh, some of you will uh, will um, one day uh, I don't know what come up with something which the world will acknowledge. Well, just like you said there were Google and other things. You see, we also have Indian companies, but we are we have more of Indian service companies. So people, um, uh, we, we give a lot of services, very nice services for that, uh, at least the IT part. But something that you create, some idea, some innovation, which the world will pay money for, that is what uh, I hope um, some of you will come up with. So, but I think you have all the skills necessary. Please also develop your soft skills, the way of communication, way of presentation, that is very, very important. Uh, and I think you are uh, very well placed and I wish you all the very best so that uh, you will make all the three institutes very proud. Oh, well, there's one more question. Maybe this is the last question because... Uh... So, uh, let's to ask, uh, like, uh, is there any kind of quiz, uh, meeting where uh, data science is not yet introduced or it won't a lot of, uh, uh, you know, potential for AI and data science for the uh, development of our project? Yes, there's nothing new, not yet Researchers that whether there is not even awareness that there might be in for data science in that field okay. is not being recognized as of now. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Yes. For example, uh, can we say uh, 
the judicial system. I think there, there is a lot of data, data science is coming in there actually. Uh, for example, there are projects, but you're right, not to that extent, but there are projects now where um, once a case comes in, it, it, it retreats past very similar cases uh, because uh, that's how the judicial system uh, progresses and that's how the court cases are, uh, are fought through uh, past cases, etc. So a lot of it is uh, coming uh, coming up now. There are, there are projects. Uh, so very difficult to say where data science is not making any inroads. Even in the policy research, and we keep on saying that in the policy research, a lot of data science is happening, but probably there, it is not yet happening to the extent that uh, is possible. But um, in industry, strategy, making strategies, etc., where to open a branch, where not to open a branch, etc., uh, a lot of analytics is already going in, in the big companies at least. So, um, yes, judiciary, uh, maybe some, uh, maybe to some extent, uh, even in maintenance, insurance, everywhere, actually, data science has come in in a big way. For example, insurance car insurance uh, so uh, in these um, uh, there are connected cars where, uh, where uh, suppose the car has met with an accident but um, nowadays it is becoming mandatory at least in other countries i don't know whether in india yet that you put in an add-on add device which monitors the behavior of the car and behavior of the driver so that uh, suppose there's a insurance claim then how valid is it whether the driver was driving under some influence um, whether the driver was driving badly uh, so based on that all these claims uh, would be processed etc so those type of things are happening quite a bit we see fantastic uh, uh, these things in uh, like uh, recommending systems uh, uh, but where it has not yet touched at all if anybody has an idea, please please do say. I really cannot think of an example where it has not touched at all. Um, you want to add that? Maybe I'm being a bit provocative, but you see, what we often probably empirically might feel that many political decisions are not based on uh, data science principles, but if you look at it from a particular perspective, I think political decisions are often depending on emotions of people, which itself are data. So that probably has never been factored out because that's a probably a field where just very objective sort of uh, decision making is difficult to make and we have probably never thought of this sort of emotional things as data. So I think it's been a very great interaction. I've enjoyed this a lot and uh, it's really nice that this has been arranged. And uh, uh, so uh, we have to call it a day because we, we could have probably gone on and on, but then uh, that's not good for either of us or for you because of an exam. We have to call it a day to study. However, uh, while we end, we'll tell you that you know we've kept you waiting for such a long time. So there's some arrangement for refreshments outside, uh, which probably make, uh, you know brighten up your spirits a little bit, uh, not really good for uh, So, uh, so uh, uh, let me end by thanking all of you for coming here and, you know, since it's a big batch, it's the auditorium looks a bit non-empty, uh, which often happens if there are very few students. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Indeed, thank you very much for organizing this interaction session and uh, I gained quite a bit through interacting with you. Uh, I really wish you all the best for your exams, all the best for your, for whatever you do, decide to do in your lives. 
Only thing is, I've seen uh, too many young minds feeling very pressurized because of different developments in life. Uh, always, and one thing is guaranteed, life will not be what you expect it to be. So kindly expect life to give you all the unexpected twists and turns. Right? Do not expect life to be easy. Life will be difficult. But again, my earnest request to you, don't make life difficult. I have seen enough people complicate matters unnecessarily. Do not complicate matters. Um, take life easy. Take life as it comes. And uh, I had uh, I told this during the convocation also that it was a realization I had in a very very uh, what should I say very sad state of affairs in my family uh, when I realized that. Come what may, tomorrow the sun will again rise, tomorrow the wind will again blow, nothing stops. So, whatever happens, never give up and never think that you are unique in your pain, in your depression, in your whatever. There are enough people who are worse off, there are enough people who are better off than you. So, if you have a very good time, do not be unnecessarily too much elated because. Remember that neither the good times nor the bad times will last forever. So take life as it comes and always remember that good times will not last, but the bad times will not last either. So you just have to give it, you know, write it out. Uh, so uh, sometimes the pressure of life, the pressure of relationships, etc., becomes so difficult to handle. But only thing is, Always keep in mind, nothing matters. Give whatever you are doing to your profession, to your uh, commitments, give your very best to whatever you are doing. Whether If you are successful, fantastic. If you are not successful, try again. Never say, this is my last time that I am going to try. You never know when you will succeed. So try again till the last day. Try. Keep on trying. Never give up. Thank you very much and wish you all the very best. Thank you much for all my things, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for organizing things and all my passionate for coming up today. And uh, thank you very much.